You can uh, find Genesis chapter 30 in your Bible. In Genesis 30, 25, we receive our first hint to the next major character in the book of Genesis. To give you a really quick overview, there are three major characters in Genesis that have to do with the Hebrew people. There's Abraham, there's the character we're studying now, Jacob, and then one of Jacob's sons, Joseph, is going to dominate the last fourth of the book of Genesis. And so he is introduced to us in uh, Genesis 30, verse 25. But also in Genesis 30, verse 25, things begin to change for Jacob, and he starts being a, a man that is blessed. Okay, grade school kids, that's the first time I said that word. Okay, are you with me now? And so things begin to change, and Jacob is still the trickster. He's still the deceiver. There's still a lot of work that God's got to do in his life, but God begins to start putting these blessings on his life. So let's look today at four things about God's unexplainable blessings. Four things about God's unexplainable blessings. The first one is this. God's unexplainable blessings can make us a conduit of blessings to others. Look with me to uh, Genesis chapter 30, verse 25. Genesis 30, verse 25. It says, after Rachel gave birth to Joseph, Jacob said to Laman, and just to remind you from last week, that is his father-in-law. Jacob's father-in-law is Laman. Send me on my way so that I can return to my homeland. Give me my wife's. I spent plenty of time explaining about that last week. We don't need to go over all that again. Give me my wife's and my children that I have worked for and let me go. You know how hard I have worked for you. But Laman said to him, if I found favor with you, stay. I have learned by divination that the Lord has blessed me because of you. Then Laman said, name your wages and I'll pay them. So Jacob said to him, you know how I've served you, how your herds were, have fared with me. For you had very little before I came, but now your wealth has increased. The Lord has blessed you because of me. And now when will I also do something for my own family Layman asked, what should I give you? The principle here is that God will bless others because of us sometimes. It's actually part of the very promise that God gave first Abraham, then Isaac, and now Jacob. And that promise was that through your seed, through your children, through the generations uh, in your uh, line of inheritance, that the world is going to be blessed. And this is going to start with Jacob blessing of all people, his father-in-law, who's been rather deceptive and tricky with him up to this point, and he's going to end up blessing him. God sometimes blesses non-believers because of us as believers. For example, you may be one of the few Christians in your family and yet God may actually protect your family and even bless your family because of you. He doesn't have to, but he might because of you. In your company that you work for, you may be one of the few Christians in that company. And God may actually bless your company because of you and the few other Christians. Because you... You conduct yourself in a, in a Christian ethical way because you have a work standard that reflects God well. And because of that, the other people see that and they recognize that their company is being blessed because of you. It could happen with your team or a group that you're with. God may actually bless that group or that team because of you. And sometimes... Non-believers actually recognize that. That's what happens in this case. Laman recognizes the reason why his herds have grown is because of Jacob, 
that God's blessed Jacob and that blessing is spilling out over onto Laban. Using his followers, God can break through sometimes to a non-believer's life as well. It, uh, Jacob actually agrees with Laban in verse 29, and he says, yes, you have been blessed because of me. And he, and he says, he reminds Laban, uh, his father-in-law for 14 years now, he reminds him that when I first came, Jacob says, your herds were small, but now they are large. They have, they have increased. And he uses that word increase in verse 29, and that word increase means uh, that something that, has something that has broken through like a dam that was holding water back and all of a sudden the dam breaks and with this sudden burst, all the water comes through. That's what that word increase means. So something had been a ceiling on Laman's life. He worked hard. He tried to have great herds and there was always a ceiling. He couldn't break through. Jacob comes and because Jacob is blessed by God, all of a sudden, the ceiling is lifted, and now his herds are multiplying. He is a wealthy man now because of Laman. Now, how might God most likely use us to bless other people? Let me make a couple of suggestions. One, when our lifestyle consistently reflects God, people will be blessed around us. In other words, we need to be looking like Christians when we're with our family, and most of them are lost. We need to be looking and acting like Christians when we're in the workforce, when we're at school, when we're with the team, we need to look and act like a Christian. How else is God going to use us to bless the non-believer if we look just like a non-believer? And the, the most difficult situation for that to happen is with our family. Because our family knows us better than anybody else. They see us at our worst, and they remember, and they don't forget, and they don't forgive very easily. And so sometimes what we have to do with our family, or maybe it's with our, in our work setting, or maybe it's in a team setting, and we mess up because we are not going to be perfect. We have to go to that family member. We have to go in that work environment, in that team environment, and we have to say, you know, I was wrong I want you to forgive me. That was really not the character I want to represent. That's not who God wants me to be, and I want you to forgive me. Because the world is not used to somebody admitting that they're wrong and asking for forgiveness. That actually will strengthen your witness to them and make them respect you even more, and perhaps your group may receive even more blessings. Another thing is that when we are recognized at our family, on our team, or at work, and they recognize our uniqueness, they recognize the, the unique contribution we bring, we need to immediately deflect attention from ourselves and give it to God. So when someone in the workforce says, you know, obviously you work with a, a level of, uh, of excellence that we're, that we're not used to, and it, and it, it appears there's something different about you, you don't say, yeah, yeah, I'm pretty good, I know I am. No, you know, you say, well, God's worked in my life, and because God's worked in my life, that's, the way I, that's why I can work the way I work. So you give glory back to God. I'm not saying that you need to give a 30-minute sermon at work. You can't do that and, and keep a job. I understand that. But you can talk about godly things from time to time. For example, probably Monday, somebody is going to ask you at work, how did your weekend go? So what would you do this weekend? How did your weekend go? And you can say several things, but one of the things that you could say is, well, we did this, this, and this. But Sunday we went to church, and there was this one little thought that I heard I hadn't thought of before, and it just really made a difference in my life. That's all you got to do. You don't have to preach a 30-minute sermon to them or anything. But you said, by, by saying that, you are telling them, I am a Christ follower. I go to church on Sundays. There's something about me that's different. And, and, and it's not that it's church. It's that I have a relationship with God just by recognizing that you were in church and there was something God said to you in that setting. Second thing for us to look at about God's unexplainable blessings is that God followers, that would be most of us, God followers listen to God so as to join God's unexplainable blessings. 
Now, sometimes the world wants to buy God's blessings, and they think the way to buy God's blessings is to offer you as a Christian a certain price. And they think that there is a price tag that you are for sale. Let's continue reading the story in verse 31. So Laban, the father-in-law, has come to Jacob and says, I want you to keep working. I know you want to leave me and go back to your homeland, but I need you to keep working because, man, my, my herds, they grow when you're here. In verse 31, Laban asked, what should I give you? In other words, what's your price? And Jacob said, you don't need to give me anything. If you do this one thing for me, I will continue to shepherd and keep your flock. Let me go through all your sheep today and remove every sheep that is speckled or spotted, every dark-colored sheep among the lambs and the spotted and speckled among the female goats. Such will be my wages. In the future, when you come to check on my wages, my honesty will testify for me. If I have any female goats that are not speckled or spotted or any lambs that are not black, they will be considered stolen. Good, said Laman, let it be as you have said. So Laman thinks that Jacob has a price tag on him. He thinks he can buy God's favor. And he comes to Jacob and he says, what can I give you? How much do you want me to pay you to keep taking care of my herds? And Jacob's been around this guy for 14 years now. And the last time Laman said, what can I, what can I give you? Well, he ended up getting a bad deal. Last week's message, Jacob said, well, I'll work seven years for you if I can get your good-looking youngest daughter. And if you were here last week, you know what happened with that. He got the ugly old one, and so that didn't work out too good. And he had to end up working 14 years for the woman he wanted to begin with. And so he's probably scratching his head thinking twice when Laban comes this time and says, you know, what can I give you? So he's pretty cautious about what he says. And the plan that he suggests in verses 32 and 33 involving these speckled sheep and everything actually came to him in a dream. He talks about this dream in chapter 31. He's speaking in the past. He says that God came to me in a dream, and God told me in this dream that this is the request I was supposed to make. So he listened to God, and because he listened to God, he was able to join God's blessings in his life. If I don't listen to God, I can't expect to join God's blessings in my life. If I want to do it my way and not listen to God, there's a pretty good chance sooner or later God's going to say, fine, do it your way. But if you want God's blessings, you need to listen to what God has to say, and Jacob does that this time. Now, in my study this week, I ran across a pretty good explanation of all this sheep stuff. I'm not a herdsman, so I needed a little help on it. And I got this explanation from a September 2016 sermon from Joe Beard from McCleary Community Church. Don't know anything about McCleary Community Church. Don't know anything about Joe Beard. He may, he may be a heathen. I don't know, but he had a really good explanation that I could understand about the sheep, so I'm going to use it, okay? In chapter 30, verse 32, Jacob proposes that his wages be all the speckled sheep in layman's herd and that all the solid colors would remain on, being owned by layman but the speckled ones would be his and from those speckled sheep he would begin to have them mate and so forth and from there he would he would he would increase his his herd in the middle east almost all the sheep are white they're either all white or they're all black. Rarely are they speckled or sometimes called splotched. Very, rarely are they that way. In fact, if you'll notice in verse 34, Laman jumps on that deal real quick. He says, yeah, I'll take that deal. Because it's believed that only about 1% to 2% of the sheep actually would be speckled. It's a recessive gene that are in all the sheep but rarely does it come out. Only 1% or 2% come out. So Layman's thinking, I'll give him 1% or 2% of the flock. It's going to take him years before he gets a flock big enough that he can sell and make money and go back to his homeland, which is what he wants to do. And Layman knows 
that as long as Jacob is there, he can do like he has been doing the last 14 years. Jacob does all the work and Laman gets all the money. And, and that's a pretty good deal. And he likes that. So, so he says, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll go with that. But Jacob listened to God. He did what God told him to do. And the result is going to be that actually Jacob ends up being a very, very wealthy man because of this decision. That leads me to the third thing to look at. When God works on our behalf, less than favorable circumstances can become fertile soil for God's unexplainable blessings. Now, you look at that sentence on the screen. Look at that phrase where it says, less than favorable circumstances. I could assume in this room there are plenty of people who could say, I have had less than favorable circumstances in my life. I've had a medical diagnosis that was less than favorable. I've had a financial crisis that was less than favorable. I've had rebellious teens that was less than favorable. I've had sick children that was less than favorable. I'm sure we could go through the list, how we've lost loved ones and all those things. Almost everyone in this room, if you've been alive for very long, you've had less than favorable circumstances in your life. Well, that phrase shows us that when God is working on our behalf, he takes the less than favorable circumstances and he actually makes it fertile soil for him to do an unexpected or unexplainable blessing in our life. So Laman hears this deal that Jacob offers. And Laman is a, I mean, he's a liar. <laughs> He is a sorry, sorry dude. And so he thinks, how can I get a better advantage? It's not enough advantage that Jacob's only going to get 1% or 2% of the flock. How can I even get a better advantage and put Jacob in a disadvantage? And so we pick up the action in verse 34. In verse 34, good, said Laman, let it be of you, as you have said. Verse 35, that day, not the next week. That day, Laman removed the streaked and spotted male goats and all the speckled and spotted female goats, every one that didn't even have white on it, and every dark colored one among the lambs. And he placed his sons in charge of them, and he put a three-day journey between himself and Jacob. And Jacob, meanwhile, was shepherding the rest of Laman's flock. Now, I don't know if you can follow all that or not, but Jacob says, okay, I'm going to take only the speckled colored ones, the, the, the non-solid colored ones. Those are going to be mine, 1% to 2% of the flock. Before Jacob can ever get there, Laman has his sons go through and get all of them and take them a three-day journey away so they can't mate uh, with, with the, with the uh, colored ones. They can't mate, and he takes them away, and all Jacob is left with is solid color sheep. And they're thinking, well, if I got solid color sheep, solid color sheep, how am I going to mate them and get speckled ones? He, he, he doesn't know how it's going to work. So immediately, Laman puts him at a great disadvantage. And Laman again has acted decept uh, deceptively. He's put Jacob at this disadvantage. However, soon. Jacob is going to be blessed by God, and he's going to become a very, very wealthy man. Because the thing about this recessive gene, as you know with any recessive gene, is you can't see it, but it's there. And it was in every one of those solid color sheep. It's just you couldn't see it. But God knew it was there, and God was going to work it out and bring it out to Jacob's advantage. Jacob, in his own feeble way, begins to try to figure out a way to take solid color sheep and get speckled sheep out of them. So he comes up with this scheme. Now, it doesn't say that God told him to do this scheme or anything. It's just his scheme. He got uh, limbs from certain trees, and he stripped part of the bark off of the limb so that the limb looked kind of striped. And he would put it in the water trough, and when the healthy sheep would come he believed that they would see that striped bark and the result of that would be that their 
offspring would be striped or spotted or so forth. And so that was the method that he used. And every time there were healthy sheep that would come, he'd put those sticks in the water, and sure enough, they would produce these speckled and striped sheep that were healthy. And every time there was some weak-looking sheep that would come up there, he wouldn't have the stripped bark there. So they would produce weak ones, and they were all solid color. So what ended up after a few years is that Jacob's crops flock, flock, flock grew more and more and more, and they were strong and healthy, and Laman's uh, flocks dwindled. They were weak, and they didn't reproduce well, and they, they had uh, uh, abnorm abnormalities and so forth with them. And through all this, Jacob is thinking that his plan is working, that his strategy is working good. You know, some try to find some natural explanation for this, that Jacob was this great, clever um, a herdsman, that he knew that there was something in those trees that made them mate more readily, made them mate uh, more frequently. Well, there wasn't anything in that bark. There wasn't anything in that tree. What was happening is that the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob was keeping his promise. You know, back up in the history, God had already told Abraham, I'm going to multiply you. You're going to be a great nation. He told his son Isaac, I'm going to multiply. You're going to be a great nation. He told Jacob, I'm going to multiply you. You're going to be a great nation. And now God is keeping his word. He's going to bless him. He's already blessed him. Joseph is his 11th son. I mean, that's a blessing. He's going to end up with 12 when it's all said and done. God's already blessed him with children. Now he's going to start blessing him financially with wealth. So really, the better view of this is not that Jacob was a great herdsman that had some trick. Really, the, the answer is that God took care of things. Now, there are some... Uh, interesting word plays I want to show you in verse 37 just for your own self-edification. I think maybe God is hinting in these words. In verse 37, it says, Jacob then took branches of fresh popular, a popular tree. Now, that word popular in the uh, Hebrew, which is what the Old Testament is written in, it is a homophone to the name layman. In other words, the two words sound alike when you pronounce them they sound alike. So popular tree sounds just like the name layman. And then the next tree it says he's going to use is an almond tree. And an almond, when that word is pronounced in the Hebrew, is pronounced luz. And I don't know if you remember that word luz or not, but luz was the region where Jacob spent the night and he had that dream with the ladder going up into heaven and the angels were coming up and down. And God says to Jacob, I'm going to bless you. You're going to come back this way. You're going to be a wealthy man when you come back this way. Your family's going to have grown. I'm going to bless you, and I'm going to bless others through you. So maybe God is hinting that through this event, he's ready to bless Jacob. Jacob assumes the success is his, but I really have to ask the question. There's, there, there, there are two reasons why it doesn't make sense that God would, would bless Jacob. The, the, the first reason is, why in the world would a holy, righteous God bless such a sorry person? Look to the person next to you and say, I think he's talking to you. <laughs> why, why in the world would a righteous, holy, perfect God bless such an unrighteous person like Jacob? And the second question is, why would God use some scheme like stripped wood, some gimmick, to bless Jacob? Well, the answer to the second question is God didn't use that stripped wood. He just did it himself. And the answer to the second question is because God said, I promise you I'm going to bless you, and God keeps his promises. Thankfully, God keeps his promises a lot better than I keep my promises. If my salvation depended upon me being perfect, I would be lost more days than I'm saved. But because God promises that he keeps me in relationship, my salvation is secure based on God, not based on me. That leads me to the fourth thing. 
Pride and jealousy can easily show up where God's unexplainable blessings are. So over the next six years, Laman's flocks dwindle, Jacob's flocks increase. In fact, it says in verse 43, it says, and the man, talking about Jacob, became very rich. He had many flocks, female and male slaves, and camels and donkeys. In other words, his flocks grew so much that he had to hire people. He had to have servants come in and help him take care of everything. He had to buy uh, donkeys and camels to transport the, the wool all, all around the area. So he became quite wealthy. And of course, when one party becomes wealthy, there's some pride that can come up in them. And Jacob's pride was this. He was still foolish enough to think that his little gimmick of putting that peeled bark limb in the water was the reason why he was so wealthy. Laman became prideful too, because Laman said, well, really, if I hadn't given him that start, he, he never would have gotten that wealthy. You know, once someone has a little bit of possession, pride can set in. But another thing that can set in is jealousy. Have you ever noticed something about jealousy? Jealousy is usually centered around comparison. It's one of my beefs. I have numerous, but one of my beefs with social media is that it's all about comparison. And it's an unre unrealistic comparison. Because we're always, and that's true not just with social media, that's true on a Sunday morning. We're always comparing people based on what we see, and all we see is their best. We know all the terrible things about us, but we see somebody else, we only see them in their Sunday morning best. We don't know all the problems they have. We think that they're actually as perfect as what they look on Sunday morning. And we know we're not that good. And comparison always leads to jealousy. That's what happens in this passage. You can go on to chapter 31 just to give you a hint of the jealousy that's going on. In chapter 31, verse 1, it says, Now Jacob heard that Laman's sons were saying, Jacob has taken all that was our father's and has built his wealth from what belonged to our father. And Jacob saw from Laman's face that his attitude towards him was not the same as before. Now think about this relationship between Jacob and his father-in-law, Laman. I mean, not, not everyone has a great relationship with their father-in-law, but most of them's not this bad. I, think about this. For the first seven years, he's not even officially the father-in-law yet. He works seven years so that he can marry Rachel. And I'm sure Jacob is really nice. I'm sure that they invite him over for Sunday lunch every, every week. I'm sure that Jacob does everything really nice to the future father-in-law. Because you know how it is. When it's the future father-in-law, you try to butter him up and you try to be really nice. You try to help out any way you can. And so that's what he does for seven years. And then on the wedding night, Laman switches daughters on poor Jacob. And the next seven years, I bet there's some tension there. Maybe he comes over for Sunday lunch, but I bet the conversation is strained. And then after that, there's six more years of this hard labor where he's doing all this work. I bet the relationship's kind of strained there. And it all ends up being comparison. Jacob's herds are larger. Laman's herds are smaller, and they start comparing. Once you start comparing to somebody else, you'll end up feeling worse about yourself because what will happen is you, you won't compare yourself with someone who has less. You always compare yourself to someone who you think has more and you'll start feeling less instead of looking at what God has given you. Is it because of these limbs that Jacob put in the water that he was so productive, that his herds grew? Or was it because God worked in that situation? Now the answer is obviously it's because of God. And Jacob is going to eventually learn that. In chapter 31, verse 5, it says this. In chapter 31, verse 5, it says, He said to them, I can see from your father's face that his attitude towards me is not the same as before. Listen to this. 
but the God of my father has been with me. See, God had a purpose for Jacob. He showed him that purpose in a dream. He, he refers to this dream in chapter 31 in the next few verses. In that dream, God showed Jacob that every one of those white sheep had a recessive gene in them. And that God was going to be in charge of bringing that recessive gene out. And that there were going to be more speckled sheep than he could imagine. And sure enough, that's exactly what happened. Because it fit into God's promise and God's purpose. Let me give you two verses that I think summarize God's promise and God's purpose for everybody in this room. The first one, probably the most famous verse in the Bible, John 3, 16. By the way, this verse is not only for people in this room. This verse is for everybody on the earth. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. God's purpose for you, his provision for you, is that you have everlasting life in heaven with God. That's what he wants. That's his purpose for you. And you can accept that. You can receive that. The only way God says you can receive it is by repentance of your sin and faith in Jesus Christ only. So you can embrace that. It's available today for you to embrace. It's yours available. And you can be on track with God's purpose. A second verse that I think in general talks about God's purpose for us is in John 10, 10. <clears throat> the second part of that verse, Jesus says, I've come that they might have life and have it more abundantly. God wants you to have abundant life. I want you to know that. He wants you to have abundant life. Now, as long as you don't define abundant life as being always wealthy and never sick, as long as you don't define it that way, God wants you to have abundant life, and this is abundant life. Abundant life is that you will know God's purpose and you will allow the power of God to work into your life to do God's purpose. That's abundant life. And Jacob is going to finally get this figured out, that God's got a purpose for him, and he needs to allow the power of God to work in his life to accomplish that purpose Today, God's purpose for you is that you understand his desire for you, his purpose for you, and that you allow the Holy Spirit to fill you to do that purpose. As Jimmy makes his way to the front, let's look at the verse on the screen. It says, delight yourself in the Lord. Be happy, rejoice in the Lord. Commit your ways to the Lord. So you got you to commit this stuff to God. Trust also in him, and he will do it. Now, I don't know what particular area God's trying to work in your life. Maybe he's trying to bring some healing to your life. Maybe he's trying to give you some comfort. Maybe he's trying to give you some direction. But if you delight in the Lord, God, I'm going to love you. I'm going to have my joy in you no matter what. If you commit your ways to the Lord and trust in him, the verse says God will do it. God, I pray for anyone in this room that if they were to die today, they don't know for certain they would spend eternity in heaven. Lord, I pray they would see that your desire, your purpose is that they would spend eternity in heaven. And God, for the rest of us that are Christians, I pray that we would see that you desire to work your very best in our lives, which means we need to surrender and commit to your ways. God, for those that aren't Christians, Lord, I pray they would see that today they could receive you as Savior. Lord, I pray you to remove their fear and apprehension. And during this song, they just come to the front and tell one of the staff members standing up here that they want to give their life to you as Savior. And God, for the people in this room that are Christians, but God, we have allowed the circumstances of life to divert us from your blessings. 
Lord, I pray that we would recommit to you and do things your way instead of ours. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.